You could play the record again, though. You'd like to take me home? With that raspy voice and gorgeous set of eyes, Kim Novak was a beauty. It's so rare to do a breakdown for a star and for them to still be with us. She is 90 years old and she is still here with us and deserving of her flowers. This is probably one of the saddest Hollywood stories that I've done so far. Right up there with Rita Hayworth's story to me, if you haven't seen my Rita Hayworth video, I will pin it in the comments for you guys to check out also because Kim Novak was supposed to be a Rita Hayworth. She was brought in to compete with Rita Hayworth and went through a lot of the similar pitfalls. And I just think she is a strong woman who really fought for her peace. You guys are going to hear about one of the worst tyrants of Hollywood during that era that really made her life a living hell to the point where she just lost the excitement to continue to do movies and had to really run to say her own life from Hollywood. We're going to get into all of that and more, but first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Kareen Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Without further ado, let's get into this video and let's start with her childhood. Now, Kim Novak, the famed actress, was born as Marilyn Pauline Novak on February 13th, 1933. Her father had been a history teacher, but became a dispatcher for the railroad in a depression, while her mother worked at a bra and girdle factory to make ends meet. Both of her parents hailed from Chicago and were of Czech heritage, but her journey to stardom was anything but smooth. As a kid, Novak was pretty unusual. She was extremely shy and would often hide behind curtains when guests came over to their house just to avoid interaction. School was a bigger challenge for her. She was always lost in her own world, daydreaming most of the time. This behavior didn't earn her any brownie points with her teachers or her classmate or even at home. In fact, they started making fun of her. Sadly, things got worse when World War II started. Her schoolmates found out that her grandfather's name was Adolf, and they used this fact to torment her even more. The Catholic family lived in an almost exclusively Jewish neighborhood, and the local children would pick on her. She said, and I quote, I often got knocked down, buried in snow, and pied with moldy deli pies. Just think what those kids had just been through. These were young, innocent Jewish kids trying to seek revenge for the murders of their kin. And it didn't help to have a grandpa whose first name was Adolf, she says. To their minds, he could have been the man next door, end quote. They'd smear rotten pies on her face, and she'd come home covered in pie and filled with humiliation. Scared to tell her parents about the bullying, she silently bore their anger because they were mad at her. Like, why are you coming home dirty? every day. But what she craved was their approval, especially her dad's, who seemed to favor her extroverted sister over her. She seemed to not be anyone's favorite in the house because she was so introverted. Her father was a troubled man, though, with mental health issues running in his side of the family, and Novak later believed that this was the reason behind her own mental health struggles. She said, and I quote, I loved my father, adored my father, but he terrified me. End quote. Novak has said she was taken advantage of as a child and touched without her consent, but she has never gone into full details. She said, and I quote, I inherited my mental illness from my father, but the RAPE must have added to it, she says. It was in my early teens by multiple boys in the backseat of a stranger's car. She never told her parents about being bullied by other children, let alone this horrific event that took place. Growing up wasn't just emotionally challenging for Novak. She also lived in a dangerous neighborhood in Chicago, always hearing about gruesome incidents of women being touched without their consent and people getting bang banged out of here. Her mother, concerned for her safety, tried to make Novak less noticeable by dressing her plainly and keeping her indoors as much as possible. Imagine living like Rapunzel, only without the tower. However, amidst all the trials and tribulations, Novak discovered her knack for performing when she acted in her high school production of Our Town. She was a natural on stage. This boosted her confidence immensely. 
She even won two scholarships to the Art Institute of Chicago. Gradually, she started blossoming into a beautiful woman, which helped kickstart her career. Her mother signed her up to a youth group called the Fair Teen Club to help her get over her shyness, and the head of the club urged her to model. She won a beauty contest and became Miss Snow Queen. And after high school, Novak tried her hand at different jobs like being a sales clerk, a dental assistant, and even an elevator operator, but none of them felt right. It was modeling where she felt most at home. And just like that, our shy little girl was ready to step out of her shell and embrace the world of glamour. Let's jump into her early career. Kim Novak's journey to the glitz and glamour of Hollywood was a courageous one. She packed up her life and headed to Los Angeles, the city of dreams. A lucky break came her way in 1953 when she got a teeny weeny role in RKO's film, The French Line. It was so small that she didn't even get credited for it. However, her dazzling beauty was impossible to miss. A keen-eyed casting director from Columbia Pictures spotted her and saw a bright future. He arranged a screen test for her and this marked the beginning of Novak's ride to fame. Novak dressed in a stunning Rita Hayworth dress, standing before a fireplace, uttering the line, all I want out of life is the love. This short but impactful screen test sealed the deal. Columbia Pictures were impressed and offered her a six month contract, hoping that she would be their next big star. The expectations were sky high. They hoped she'd fill the shoes of their previous star, Rita Hayworth, or even rival the success of Marilyn Monroe from 20th Century Fox. But Novak was not just another pretty face. She was determined to carve her own path. This determination became evident when the studio tried to change her name to Kit Marlowe. Harry Cohn, mm, the evil Diddy-esque personality, the head of Columbia Pictures, argued nobody's gonna go see a girl with a Polak name, but Novak stood her ground insisting I'm Czech, but Polish, Czech, no matter, it's my name, end quote. After much back and forth, they reached a compromise and she became Kim Novak. Harry Cohn discovered the actress, but was cruel to her. I made you, I can break you, she says Cohn would tell her. But the studio's meddling didn't stop there. They wanted her to lose weight, about 15 pounds, because they thought she was chubbier in the face than most of the stars of that era, and even dyed her hair multiple times to achieve the perfect blonde. They also provided her with a new wardrobe designed by the famous Jean-Louis. All these changes were part of the studio's plan to transform Novak into a Hollywood icon. But their control over her life extended beyond her appearance. Paranoid about his new investment, Cohn made sure that Novak was constantly under surveillance. She lived in a dormitory with a strict curfew and was even followed by detectives when she left the premises. This level of control earned Cohn criticism from many quarters. Brennan Scott, a Hollywood reporter, once commented, and I quote, Harry Cohn used Kim Novak like a chess piece. Her only problem was, in the beginning, she wasn't a very good actress, and I think she knew that, end quote. Novak says she didn't know how to act, so she just reacted because she was starring in melodramas where large performances were expected. If not demanded, the critics often slated her. Cohn put Novak on a stringent diet, all the while calling her that fat Polak. She followed an exercise regimen. She was assigned a makeup artist. Her teeth were capped. Her hair was dyed blonde, then rinsed to make it gleam lavender in the light. Even though Novak was a newcomer in Hollywood, she managed to hold her own. She used her charm and tenacity to navigate through the rough waters and emerged as a true star. Let's take a quick intermission for her beauty secrets that made her this iconic star. Kim Novak was like any other teenager at 14, grappling with body image issues and a strong desire to transform herself. She was dissatisfied with her naturally fine white blonde hair, which she thought was too flat. Her eyelashes were far too sparse for her liking, and in her eyes, her skin resembled the pale color of skimmed milk. But Kim was not one to wallow in self-pity. She made it her mission to learn the secrets of beauty and glamour. Many Hollywood actresses rely on professional makeup artists to maintain their glamorous look. Not Kim Novak, though. She's an experimenter at heart. Kim applies her makeup in natural daylight to assure herself of a natural look when the night falls. Her makeup routine is simple, a light eyebrow pencil and non-glaring lipstick. She used to cut her own hair. 
According to Kim, all you need are scissors, practice, and two mirrors and very good light. When it comes to her makeup palette, Kim doesn't shy away from colors. She experiments with various shades of powders, lipsticks, and mascaras, even mixing them at times to find the perfect hue. She believes in matching her makeup to the color of her dress. Her hair care routine is just as meticulous. When she's not filming, she shampoos her hair twice a week with an oil-based shampoo suitable for dry hair. Every night after her relaxing bath, she sets her hair in standing pin curls across the top of her head. They don't bother her in her sleep since she doesn't set the back of her hair. In the morning, instead of combing or parting her hair, she brushes out the curls to achieve a soft and seemingly tussled look. Kim's skin is naturally dry. While she uses soap on her body during her bath, she avoids using it on her face. Instead, she creams her face at night after removing her makeup with a skin freshener. To prevent her skin from getting too greasy, she uses a mild astringent in the morning. Indulgence for Kim is a fluffy milk bath rinse where she can relax for hours. Afterwards, she pampers her skin with a bath oil rub. She doesn't bathe in the morning but prefers to start her day with exercises. Kim understands the power of a signature scent. She says perfume stirs up memories, especially for men, since their sense of smell is subtle than ours. I think it should be associated in a man's mind with only one fragrance. She's not a fan of jewelry either, especially earrings or necklaces. Her reason, and I quote, I want people to look at me, she grins. Novak sounds as husky as ever. They used to say it was a voice fashioned by whiskey and fags. She says that is nonsense. I never smoke cigarettes, awful stuff. They don't make you feel good. And I was never a drinker. I smoke grass, I still do. It's relaxing. I like stuff that gives me images in my head, end quote. Now, in terms of her later career, Kim Novak's journey to stardom wasn't a swift rocket ride, but more like a slow and steady climb up the Hollywood ladder. She started her career with a few films that did quite well, but it wasn't until 1955 when she started in the film Picnic that she really started turning heads. The Cherry on the Top, the film was a huge hit and even got her a Golden Globe nomination for Most Promising Newcomer. Kim's star was definitely on the rise. Over the next couple of years, she appeared in a string of successful movies that made her one of the biggest box office draws of 1957 and 1958. Audiences adored her, but there was one person who didn't share their enthusiasm, her father. You think that seeing his daughter become a Hollywood star would make him proud, right? But sadly, that wasn't the case. The bigger Kim's fame grew, the more it strained her already fragile relationship with her father. Her success seemed to shine a spotlight on their differences rather than, you know, bridge them together. His views on Hollywood were harsh and judgmental. He saw the glitz and the glamour as a facade for something sinister, and he believed that his daughter must have, like, sold her soul or did something terrible to achieve the level of fame that she had. And to make matters worse, he refused to watch any of her films. There were no words of encouragement, no signs of pride, and certainly no I love you. But Kim didn't let her father's disapproval stop her. She continued to shine brightly in Hollywood, and in 1958, she landed a big role in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. That's also my favorite movie from her. Comment below your favorite movie. But even this prestigious gig came with its own set of problems. Kim felt that she was being underpaid by Columbia, her studio, and decided to take a stand. She refused to show up for work on the Vertigo set in protest of her measly salary, $1,250 a week. She even hired new agents and demanded a better contract. The studio's response? They suspended her. But after a few weeks of tense negotiations, they finally gave in and offered her a new contract that reflected her status as a major star. Her weekly salary was now $3,000 a week, which was a lot during that era. Kim was proud of her victory. She told the press, I don't like to have anyone take advantage of me, end quote. Her studio, however, was still fixated on her image. They agreed to a peculiar publicity stunt. Everything about Kim had to be lavender, including her hair. The idea was to make her stand out amidst all the other blondes in Hollywood. But for Kim, this was a nightmare. She hated the color lavender. But as always, her opinion didn't matter to the studio. All they cared about was what would bring them more money. The role in Vertigo held a special meaning for Kim. She felt a strong connection with her character. She explained, and I quote, when I first read those lines where she says, I want you to love me for me, and all the talking in that scene, I just identified with it so much. She felt like she had experienced the same thing when she first arrived in Hollywood. The pressure to change her appearance, the constant need for approval, and the desperate desire to be loved for who she truly was. Kim Novak wasn't just playing a character in Vertigo, she was telling her own story.
Kim Novak's experience working with Alfred Hitchcock on the film Vertigo was in her own words peculiar. She described him as a gentleman, yet she found their working relationship to be somewhat odd. I don't know if he ever liked me, she admitted. I never sat down with him for dinner or tea or anything except one cast dinner and I was late to that. Now it wasn't Kim's fault that she was tardy for the event, but she suspected that Hitchcock thought she had delayed her arrival on purpose in order to make a grand entrance. That misunderstanding seemed to sour their relationship. And during filming, Hitchcock kept his thoughts about her performance to himself, leaving Kim feeling unsure of where she stood with him. As it turned out, Hitchcock hadn't wanted her in his film in the first place. He had originally chosen Vera Miles for the role. Kim only discovered this fact after the film was completed. Hitchcock didn't like having me in his picture and he felt I was ruining it, she revealed. Despite his harsh judgment, Kim remained proud of her work in Vertigo, which earned her some of the best reviews of her career. Vertigo received mixed reviews when it first hit the screen in 1958. It barely broke even at the box office, but its reputation has grown over time and today it is considered a cult classic, one of Hitchcock's masterpieces. In fact, in a 2012 poll conducted by the British Film Institute Sight and Sound magazine, Vertigo was named the best film of all time, knocking Orson Welles' Citizen's Kane off the top spot it had held for 50 years. Kim's performance in the film also garnered mixed reviews. While some critics were unimpressed, others were pleasantly surprised by her portrayal. Novak later reunited with James Stewart for the film Bell Book and Candle, a modern day witchcraft comedy that was a hit at the box office. She followed that up with a role opposite Frederick March in the romantic drama Middle of the Night. Of all her films, Middle of the Night holds a special place in Kim's heart. Kim Novak has always been the dutiful actress, you know, agreeing to everything her studio commanded her to do. However, everything changed when she fell head over heels in love with a man deemed off limits by society, the incredibly talented entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. The year was 1957. Davis, smitten by Novak from afar, confided in his friend Tony Curtis about his longing for her. Curtis, ever the opportunist, saw an opportunity to play Cupid. He told Davis and I quote, I'm going to throw a party at my house and I'll make sure Kim is there. And so the stage was set for Novak and Davis to meet. At Curtis' party, Novak and Davis hit it off instantly. They engaged in deep, intense conversations, far beyond the usual small talk at such events. It wasn't a one-sided attraction either. Novak had been interested in Davis long before they met at the party. But unfortunately, their budding romance didn't remain a secret for long. A guest at the party noticed the chemistry between them and promptly spilled the beans to the press. Davis, trying to control the situation, called Novak, insisting that he wasn't the source of the rumors. He said, we can handle it any way you think best. I realize the position you're in with the studios, end quote. But Novak, valuing her own independence, invited him over for a spaghetti dinner instead of brushing him off. Aware that Harry Cohn's spies were watching her every move, Novak had to be clever about their dates. She and Davis turned their romance into a stealth mission, evading the prying eyes of the press and their employers. To avoid detection, Davis would even hide under a rug in the back of the car on his way to Novak's house. Their relationship was risky, not just because of their high-profile careers, but also because of the prevailing racial segregation in America at the time. Their romance was a bold challenge to the prejudices of their industry and society, and unfortunately, their secret couldn't be kept forever. While in New York, Cohn discovered his star actress scandalous affair and was furious. The prejudices of the time meant that if Novak married a black man, it would likely end her career. Cohn was determined to prevent this at all costs, even if it meant resorting to illegal measures. With his connections to the underworld, Cohn enlisted mobster Mickey Cohan to intimidate Davis' father, Sam Davis Sr., at the Hollywood Park racetrack. Cohan delivered a terrifying message saying, listen, I got some terrible news for you. I just got a call from Chicago to hurt Sammy, end quote. Faced with this threat, Davis had one option to avoid harm, marry a black woman within, within 48 hours. And under this pressure, Davis had no choice but to leave Novak and marry the talented black singer, Loray White, even paying her to go along with it. Cohn's meddling had effectively ended Novak and Davis' relationship. 
leaving Novak heartbroken. I can't even imagine. She retreated from the public eye for a while, reflecting on this tumultuous period. She said, it was a very dangerous relationship. Then a white woman and a black man, no matter his status, it simply didn't mix publicly. I was suddenly in the eye of a hurricane. My agent told me my career would be over if I continued to see Sammy. Some of my friends wouldn't even return my telephone calls, end quote. Let's talk about her leaving Hollywood. By the end of 1966, she was emotionally drained and no longer wanted to live the life of a Hollywood movie star. In the glare of the spotlight with the press scrutinizing her every move, from then on, acting became a job and was no longer a career of choice. Novak preferred to concentrate on her first love, the visual arts, often writing poetry to accompany her paintings and even writing some song lyrics. She told The Guardian, and I quote, she had enough of the movies. She had struggled with depression ever since her teens and she feared for herself. When you're happy, you're on a cloud higher than anybody can see. All of a sudden, the cloud turns gray and it starts putting pressure on you. And before you know it, you're down at the bottom of the hole again. You can get lured into loving yourself too much. That's why I left Hollywood. I didn't want to get into all of that. I didn't want to lose myself. I needed to leave to save myself. I like who I am, even with the suffering you go through, even with the fact that when you're vulnerable, you feel everything so intensely. It's exciting to dress up in gorgeous clothes and to feel sexy and to look sexy. It's wonderful but it's a trap. You become satisfied with that being enough, then later in life, it isn't enough. So many people, once they got older and were no longer looked at for their beauty, just fell apart, end quote. One reason she never got carried away, she says, is because of her parents. She did everything for their approval and never got it. Her father saw her first two films and refused to see any more. He hated the idea that she was a sex symbol. He was afraid of seeing me in a light that he didn't want to see me in, end quote. And she was disappointed by the work she was being offered. Offered. Cohen had died in 1958, and by the 60s, she was largely being offered parts as a scantily clad beach babe. She wasn't interested. I wanted to be appreciated for what I was as a person and what I had to offer. I didn't feel my work meant anything there. I knew I was a good artist, and I wanted to express my feelings. Not the writers or the directors. I wanted to express me. I wanted to play the role of somebody who was mentally ill. I think I would have done a really good job because I knew those feelings." End quote. After her retirement from acting, Novak made only rare public appearances and turned down most offers she received. M. Novak's journey through Hollywood was like a roller coaster ride. She had her highs, sure, but she also had some really real lows, the kind that make your stomach knot up and your heart race. And those memories, they were painful. So painful, in fact, that her mind decided to do her a favor and erase them from her memory. You see, Kim's time in the spotlight wasn't all glitz and glamour. It was tough and it left scars so deep that even when she tried to revisit those times in her memory, her brain would put up a wall. You couldn't remember much of her fame. When reporters asked her about those days, she'd draw a blank. And then in 1996, something happened. Kim decided to come out of retirement to promote the re-release of Vertigo. But when it was time for the interviews, the questions about her Hollywood career seemed to hit her like a ton of bricks. All the old feelings feelings came rushing back and she found herself unable to talk about it fully and completely traumatized. Feeling cornered, Kim did what she does best. She ran away. But this time, she didn't just run away from the press or the public eye. She ran away from everything. She packed her bags and moved to the Pacific Northwest, far away from the bright lights and prying eyes of Hollywood. In the middle of nowhere, surrounded by trees and the calming sounds of nature, Kim found peace. Her friend Norma Herbert said it best. She is very happy in her forest, end quote. But even in her newfound tranquility, there was one person Kim could never forget, Sammy Davis. Davis Jr. Kim and Sammy's love story was a tale as old as time, a tale of two lovers torn apart by society, but fate, it seems, had other plans for them. Kim and Sammy crossed paths again, not once, but twice. The first time was at the Academy Awards. They arrived together, sharing a private moment before heading into the ceremony. After the awards, they danced together at the governor's ball, drawing no attention from the crowd. Sammy was surprised. Not one picture. Nobody even took one picture. Their second meeting was under much sadder circumstances. Sammy was battling throat cancer and was in the hospital. Kim visited him, sitting by his side as they shared a quiet, tender moment. 
In between her roller coaster ride with Sammy and her retreat to the Pacific Northwest, Kim had other relationships. She dated Ramfis Trujillo, the son of a Dominican dictator, and was even engaged to director Richard Quinn. She was married twice, first to English actor Richard Johnson and then to Robert Malloy, a veterinarian she met when one of her horses fell ill. Kim's life took on another unexpected turn in 2010 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her husband ended up dying in 2020, and Novak says her 45 years with her husband were the happiest of her life and that things have been tough since his death. There were times I didn't want to keep going without him, but now I light a fire every night and I fix something special. All the things he liked. He loved my chicken dumplings, I think. Why didn't I make that more for him? Painting, she says, has got her through the worst of it. Kim never had any children. She says that apart from her husband, her relationship with animals have been the most important in her life. I'm sure it's my mothering instinct. Since I've never had children, the animals are my children, she said. Did she want children? No. To tell you the truth, I was always afraid that they'd have mental illness as well, and I didn't want them to suffer, end quote. In the early 2000s, Novak was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Since then, she has spent time trying to normalize it, telling people it's just another illness that can be treated in her case with antipsychotic. Hollywood can be a tough town. Kim Novak, now in her golden years, she's no stranger to the harsh glare of the spotlight. But even after all these years, it seems Hollywood isn't quite done with abusing her. Back in 2014, Kim decided to step out of her quiet life and grace the Academy Awards with her presence. It was a rare public appearance and the press pounced on the opportunity to take a few jabs at her. Gossip about alleged botched plastic surgery started flying and some folks weren't shocked about voicing their cruel opinions. It really did throw me into a tailspin and it hit me hard, Kim confessed. Even Donald Trump felt the need to weigh in tweeting, Kim should sue her plastic surgeon, end quote. Despite the hurtful comments, Kim tried to shake it off. After all, everyone made mistakes, right? We do some stupid things in our lives, she mused. She admitted to getting fat injections in her face because it seemed less invasive than a facelift. But hindsight is always 2020, and she regretted her decision. I trusted some somebody doing what I thought they knew how to do best. I should have known better, she lamented. That wasn't the only stupid mistake she claimed she did that night. She says, and I quote, I took a Valium on an empty stomach because I was trying to starve myself to lose a couple pounds. I was just like, arg, I had no energy. And she says, it reminded her she wasn't made for Hollywood. I thought I'm too vulnerable for this town. I take things to heart too much, end quote. A couple of weeks later, she returned to Hollywood to do an interview in front of a live audience. I didn't want them to think that they had got the best of me. So I went and talked about bullies in the interview. Since since then, she has campaigned against bullying. There are kids who have taken their lives over what has been said about them. I felt I wanted to help be a role model, end quote. But hey, life goes on and so did Kim's. She turned her attention to her creative pursuits, becoming a photographer, poet, and visual artist. Her paintings, which range from impressionistic to surrealistic, are as unique as she is. She even published a book in 2021 featuring her artwork aptly titled Kim Novak, Her Art and Life. Kim's extraordinary career hasn't gone on notice. She received her fair share of accolades over the years. In 1960, she got her own star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Fast forward to 19. And she was ranked 92nd of Empire Magazine's list of the 100 sexiest stars in film history. In 1997, she was honored with a Golden Bear for Lifetime Achievement at the 47th Berlin International Film Festival. And she even left her mark literally at Grauman's Chinese Theater doing a handprint and footprint ceremony in 2012. Kim's influence extends far beyond the silver screen. She's inspired countless actors and even fashion designers. Nicole Kidman once wrote her a heartfelt letter praising her as an inspiration to me and to women everywhere. British fashion designer Alexander McQueen was so taken with her that he named his first it bag the Novak. He explained, I'm drawn to Kim Novak in the same way that Hitchcock was. Through it all, Kim has lived her life with dignity, authenticity, and fearless determination to follow her heart wherever it leads. And that, folks, is what real star power looks like. And I hope she has a peaceful remainder of her ear years. She deserves it. And it's so cruel how after all of these years, she came back and still knowing how superficial Hollywood is, 
was, went to touch up her face to try to still adhere to the standards and was brutally mocked in such a horrific, horrific way <laughs> that even the president, so many people look up to her now. So many people love her films, her body of work. Leave some flower emojis in the comments for her and let her know we still love you, girl. Okay. Comment below who else would you guys like to see next? Thank you for tuning in. And if you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother until next time.